Hello, everyone, and welcome to WooStream, where we're bringing the Willamette community together. I'm Eric Lassan, and we are joined by Dr. Christopher Foss for today's conversation. Chris is an alum from the class of 2007, a historian, and an adjunct professor at Tokyo International University of America. Chris has also taught courses at Willamette University, the University of Portland, and Washington State University, Vancouver. His book, Facing the World, is out this month from Oregon State University Press. Today, we'll talk about Chris's dual role as a Willamette alum and a historian slash adjunct professor. We'll also cover topics including Chris's new book, The Value of a Willamette Education, and his approach to writing and teaching. So Chris, it's really great to have you on here today with us, and uh, the WooStream community is excited to, to hear from you. So maybe just let's jump right in and maybe have you start off by talking a little bit about your dual role as a, as a historian and professor. Sounds good, Eric. And I want to just, first of all, thank you for having me on and, and inviting me to be a part of what looks like a really exciting new initiative to uh, spread the word about Willamette and the great things that Willamette community, faculty, alums, students are doing. I think this is really, really exciting, so I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, so let me address, so you're, you're, we're talking about kind of how I balance that dual role of being a historian and adjunct professor. And so, you know, I, I think it's in some ways similar to what a tenured um, professor would, would face. So as many of listeners know or maybe don't know, um, your professor at Willamette or at any other university has two big roles. The teaching aspect, so teaching your two or three classes a semester, but then also the research and writing aspect. And um, at a school like Willamette, the teaching is always going to come first. Um, at the school where I got my PhD from, University of Colorado, bigger school, what we call an R1 or research university. So the research um, is going to come first. Um, but so what I, it's a balancing act. And so all academic historians are going to face that balancing act. But um, what's interesting about what I'm, the position I'm in as an adjunct is that um, my work is by contract, semester by semester. And so many young historians have to start off as adjuncts and then work their way up to a tenured position um, some will spend years doing this. Um, some will get there in no time at all. It just kind of depends on a lot of different factors. Um, but when you're trying to do be an adjunct and balance being a historian and an adjunct, um, you're not only trying to finish or continue your work writing wise, whether it be research, writing, editing, whatever stage you're in, but you're also trying to teach and look for the next job, look for what is the next contract going to be, maybe work at multiple different schools. Um, I'll give you an example that in the fall of 2018, I taught at TIUA, I taught at the University of Portland, and I taught at Washington State Vancouver all in the same semester. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, I jump in my car after my morning class at UP, right on up, drive on up I-5 to Washington State Vancouver, um, and teach in the afternoon. And then Tuesday, Thursdays, I teach at TIUA, come all the way down from Portland to Salem. Um, it's exciting. It's, it's tiring sometimes. Um, and it's a balance that um, I think has helped make me um, compassionate and adaptable. You know, I think compassionate to what a variety of different student populations go through because I'm teaching students who are state university students, private university students. T uh, typical students, uh, typically aged students, like 18 to 22, or older students, military students, perhaps, uh, um, exchange students with TIUA, obviously, I've had a lot of different experiences. So compassion and adaptability, adapting to multiple campuses, adapting to multiple information systems, adapting to multiple libraries and different ways of accessing information, different ways of accessing technology. So the hope is that all those skills will help me when I get on the, the tenure track. So it's, um, that's, I, 
I, that's, that's kind of where I think the, the dual role, um, is, is interesting and has, has, has helped me out a lot. Wow. That, that's, um, that's pretty amazing to think about the ways that you have to kind of flow and, and seamlessly change hats to be now I'm on this campus and I'm teaching this yeah. subject and I've, I'm with this population of students and how do I adapt and, and relate and, and, and kind of remember where you are in those, in those different, you know, contexts. So that's, that's, that's impressive. Um, and so, you know, I think when I think, when I, when I look at your situation and, 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 you know, what you've described so far, I think about a liberal arts education and how that, you know, segues really well or pairs really nicely with kind of the experience that you're creating for yourself at the moment. Um, so maybe talk a little bit more about that, your, your, your time at Willamette as a student mm -hmm. and maybe the ways that that prepared you, um, you know, for, for this point in your life and career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I came into Willamette knowing that I wanted to pretty much knowing that I wanted to study history. Um, I was 16 when the September 11th terrorist attacks happened. So I was a junior in high school and my feeling was that, that I wanted to, the, the, what I wanted to do in college and I didn't know how this would, would translate into life after college. I really wasn't thinking that far ahead, but I wanted to, to figure out kind of in my own mind, what were some of the historic roots of 9-11 to try to understand it in my own way by looking back through the history, like what was the deeper history really of everything that was going on now? So really doing something that I've always done, which is kind of, which is to relate the mod, the present day to history. And so that led me into thinking about U.S. history quite explicitly in the 20th century on into the 21st now. So Willamette, um, it helped that I have really outstanding professors. Um, Ellen Eisenberg was my first advisor. Um, I took classes from her and from Bill Smaldone and from Seth Kotler, and they were uh, my biggest influences within the history department itself. I also really enjoyed classes outside of the department that were historical in, in nature in some way. Um, before College Colloquium, we had a, an introductory freshman course called Worldviews, and I took that with um, Patricia Barras, who more of you may know as a Spanish uh, professor of Spanish, but she was teaching the Worldviews section that semester, and we looked a lot at um, various different we went back as far as Thucydides to look at really the history of, of, of war and um, its impacts across society. And classes like that, as well as um, uh, English professor Ken Nolley's history of cinema classes from a lot of different departments really um, kind of steeped me in um, a, a greater backing of history that I found was, was really interesting. Um, and then going and doing study abroad in London in the spring of 2006. So you get a lot of history there. Um, just, and so just a constant exposure to both experiences and people. And I think that's really what the liberal arts education that I have um, gave me was a constant exposure to people at, who were passionate about the study of history, who, you know, went beyond just, and I can talk a little bit more about this and some of the other parts of the of the discussion here, but but who went beyond just saying, okay, here's what happened. Memorize it, write a paper on it, or take a test on it. Um, really challenging you to, to think more critically and to really develop your own interpretations. And so I think that helped me tremendously in determining that I would like to emulate that in my own career. Well, excellent. So I, I, I can't wait anymore. I want to talk about your new book. I think it's called Facing the World. Yeah. I'm very excited to hear more about that. Maybe talk a little bit about the impetus. Like what, what was the genesis of the book and, and what was the process for writing yeah. it? And yeah, absolutely. Um, so Facing the World came out. Um, so I was in grad school. We fa fast forward to um, about the spring of 2012 at this point. And 
Um, I was in my third, going on my fourth year of graduate school, history, University of Colorado. I'd come this far and trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do exactly in terms of my topic. And this is not something that's uncommon to graduate students, even ones that come out of a great institution like Willamette. But so I literally had the, the, the proverbial light bulb moment um, where I read this article which taught in, in an academic journal which talked about um, how U.S. foreign policy, U.S. foreign relations impacts different regions. And I had always thought about U.S. foreign relations, uh, U.S. and the world sort of, as being interesting to me, and that was what I was studying generally. But connecting it to uh, regional study and going into one specific region, looking at, at how a region interacts with foreign policy really interested me. So start working on that in a research paper that fall, um, decided I liked it. And so in the fall, uh, after going through my comprehensive exams and a uh, dissertation um, uh, discernment sort of paper that I had to do going, then I went on and started doing the research. So I spent better part of three years researching and writing the dissertation. And I, in this way, I was able to create a re really original product that makes what I feel like is this very original argument that, um, but a simple one, I think. Political power matters. And in the Pacific Northwest, political power really mattered down at the level of the senator, the congressperson, uh, the governor. I look at several different key examples. Um, the idea at the time was to really try to get people to understand this. And I think that in recent years, people understand the effect of political power maybe more than they did um, even earlier in the, in the 2010s. Um, but the book really kind of came out of that idea of wanting to put um, political history, connecting it with foreign policy history and put that um, sort, of, sort of front and center. Um, just real quick, I just want to say uh, on a practical level, what the project allowed me to do was um, I, I got to go to a lot of cool and interesting places to do my research. I went to Seattle. I spent time in Eugene at University of Oregon, Seattle at University of Washington, Pullman, Washington State University, Boise, Boise State University, um, Ann Arbor, University of Michigan, the, the Gerald Ford papers, the LBJ papers at UT Austin. Um, and so I got to connect with archivists and scholars who helped me in various ways with my career later on down the line. And I also got to meet a lot of really interesting people along the way at places I was staying, uh, Airbnbs, um, staying with friends I knew in the, in the community, um, that sort of thing. And so you get a lot of practical experience, I think, that you don't think about when you think about this, like the idea of writing a book. It's not such always such a solitary sort of experience. And um, it, it just, I just found it really fun. I just found it a really, really fun um, process overall. Wow, that's that's really cool. So when you were doing the research, and it sounds like you knew you were doing the research for your dissertation, but did you also have in mind that this could, could very easily become a book as well? Absolutely. Um, my advisor in graduate school, he, I think he was really good at, at understanding that you know you have to get a book out in order to have any sort of shot in in a, a tenure track career. That didn't used to be the case. Um, Many of my professors at Willamette, they came out with books, but a lot later. The exhortation, I think, was a little bit different, even as recently as 30 years ago, okay. coming out of graduate school. So, so my advisor at CU, University of Colorado, was really great at saying, Chris, you need to think about how not only are you going to write to a narrow academic audience, but how are you going to write to uh, the every person on the street? This is the person who is interested vaguely in Pacific Northwest history or in political 
history post 1945, but who may not be an expert, someone who needs a little bit more. Um, and so, so all along what I was trying to do through my writing was to make it more and more accessible. Now I'm not going out there and saying that I'm Doris Kearns Goodwin by any means, or David McCullough, you know, writing a, a narrative flow. Um, you have to strike kind of a balance between that, that academic writing and kind of the writing for a really general audience. Um, but that that's kind of what I've been doing all the way. And I've been really blessed to have editors, a um, uh, variety of, um, blind peer reviewers to read my writing along the way and to help. And it's really been a process of I'm about, it was, it was really, I should say the book is finished, but of over seven years of, of getting the writing down and, and making it better and having a book in mind. Excellent. Excellent. Um, you mentioned a kind of the interactivity of the process, but then also the ways in which the the kind of history and politics kind of work together or flow together in your book. Mm. Um, are there are there some any any particular highlights that you would that you would pull out to just mention that you know with regard to the current situation we're in with the COVID nineteen. Uh, pandemic and the way in which you know governors have had to mobilize you know on the local level local more local level than on the federal level but then the ways in which the federal and the and the state governments are trying to to work through this or or maybe there are some other aspects of our current yeah. situation that that might be reflected in your book yeah the i'll give you the example i've been talking a lot about well one with the media and one um with with a osu press blogger that a couple of different folks have talked to um the best example i think is I, I talk a lot about um senator mark hatfield in the book and in a variety of different contexts um but one of when Hatfield was in a position of power in the Senate um, in the 80s and 90s especially, one of his priorities was um, public health and getting more money funded for public health. And the senator, he saw this as a national security imperative. He thought that too many people saw national security as bullets and planes and tanks and troops. and to, to him, too many people were, were, were trying to fight the old Cold War. We're trying to fight um, this theoretical Soviet um, fight or com and a communist fight that, that to him, Vietnam had proven could never be won. And so for Hatfield, he was in a way thinking that on to the next fight. And to him, it, it, when, you, when you look at some of his speeches and some of his, his clippings, the, it becomes apparent that his – um, you know, to him, education and public health were first and foremost. Let's build a society that can be ready and educated to take on um, what he thought were, and he actually says in one of his speeches, viruses are coming. We used to say it was the Russians that are coming. Well, now viruses are coming. Um, he fought to save the National Institutes of Health in 1995 from budget cuts. Um, one of his last major accomplishments as a senator before retiring. Um, he pumped in tens of millions of dollars of federal funds to Oregon Health and Science University in the 1980s and 1990s um, to build up what had arguably been a rather mediocre school into a premier research and teaching university and one that's now on the front lines, as we know, um, at, as of April of 2020, fighting uh, against COVID-19. Um, so Hatfield was, was he, you know, this wasn't like the grade A number one priority. I, w I would not go so far as to say he was Nostradamus and being like, oh, it's coming, you know. But mm -hmm. he, he, he listened to doctors. He, he had many doctors among his friends, researchers at places like OHSU and NIH, and they were in his ear about getting more funding for research and and those are the folks that really knew, um, but they were successful, I think, in getting Hatfield to also take that matter seriously. And so I talk about some of that to some extent. Oh, interesting. Interesting. 
And I think uh, this might be a good time to mention as well. We, we plan to have you at Willamette at mm-hmm. some point, right. To do a, a, a broader talk about your book. Um, is that. Yeah, we were scheduled uh, with the history department for April 16th. That obviously isn't going to happen. Um, uh, Professor um, Ellen Eisenberg is organizing um, the event, which we hope will take place um, early in the fall semester. Um, granted, we're all back and, and whatnot. So you can look forward to um, coming out, hopefully, or, or hearing me over, over Woostream talking more about this at, at, at that time. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you can pre-order the book. I should say, I'll just yeah. throw in a quick plug. Pre-order the that. book. Um OSU through OSU Press's website. Just put throw it in your Google. Oregon State University Press, uh, facing the world, and you should be able to get a link to the page. Um, as we speak, the book is stuck in the warehouse because we're on lockdown and we are not wanting to spread COVID nineteen. So we are not letting the book out at the moment. Um, but once we get a little bit more clearance from the governor. We hope later this summer we can get that book out and get those pre-orders out. I know some folks already have bought those and are really anxious to to get a handle uh, or to get a hold of those. Um, so get those pre-orders in. We're also hoping for a Kindle or um, PDF version um, as well. So stay tuned on that. Fantastic. Yeah, I like the idea of pre-order so that way it's just there as soon as it is released out of the warehouse, it'll yep. it'll ship to folks's folks uh, homes. That's a that's a good idea. Absolutely. And it's paperback, so it's not it's not going to break the bank. I don't remember the MSRP right at the moment. I think it's between 25 and, and 30. Um, so it's not a lot of academic books what are great books, unfortunately, are, are quite spendy, but this mm-hmm. OSU Press does a great job of keeping its content uh, very affordable for, for general readership. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you ready to, to pivot a little bit and talk more about your teaching and Let's maybe even maybe segue into how did your, you know, not only your time at Willamette and, and your choice to become a historian, but then your research for yeah. your book, how does that all relate to and come out in your teaching and what are your favorite subjects to your courses? To Absolutely. Teach? Yeah. So typically, well, I'll, I'll, I'll um, talk about courses. Um, typically I, Adjuncts typically teach a lot of surveys, um, early U.S., modern U.S. Um, if you do other, if you do other geographic areas, you usually get early modern world or modern world, what used to be called Western Civ, that sort of thing. Um, those are fun courses, but I really love the courses where you get to burrow down and focus in on a subject. Um, and I, at University of Portland, I taught course on the Cold War in America in the spring of 2018, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I've taught classes on Pacific Northwest history. Um, At TIUA, I've taught courses on civil rights history and Pacific Northwest Japan relations. Um, So when you can really dig in and uh, get very specific with, with the literature, and, and I think students enjoy those a little bit more too. When, when, you, when you teach the survey, you're, you're trying to cover a lot of different things. And sometimes that can be hard and, and a student can come in and, and have an area which they're keyed into and then once you move beyond it, uh, maybe it, it gets a little harder to, to, uh, to maintain their interest. Um, so so that's, that's a challenge that sometimes, sometimes they have. So I was just wondering if there was any other, you know, way that you would describe your, your pedagogy of teaching or, uh, or just, you know, absolutely other ways of interacting with students in in the coursework. Yeah. A lot of this comes from my Willamette experience as well. Um, and, um, even going back as far as high school, but particularly at Willamette, um, I came to really appreciate that, lecture was de-emphasized for in favor of more discussion, critical thinking, reading, writing. Um, so again, as I said earlier, it's not so much that you get the information and then you like write a test on it. You interact with the information. You come in prepared. Professor will add something a little bit more to it. Uh, But then you will work on questions, you'll work on problems, you'll work on applying the information to a different context. Um, And 
I, I think that the engaging students in class that way, it worked really well for me. And so I wanted to pass that on to, to my students. Um, and that, that is an approach that I think works really well, even at, at big universities. Um, probably not so well in the 100 person lecture halls, but I've been lucky enough not to have to teach 100 people. I've, I've only, I think, the max biggest class I've taught is 35 students. Um, and, um, but I say short lectures are good at times, especially in like a 90 minute class where you have to, you know, provide a little bit more information, shake it up a little bit. Um, and in terms of shaking it up, I like having guest lectures every now and then, a guest, um, a field trip, I mean, a movie every semester to kind of shake it up. And I'm certainly not alone amongst teachers, um, I would say, in doing that. And just to kind of cap off this discussion, I think that once we're all back in, in the classroom, um, I think that what I want to do is continue to reinvent myself, to, to continue to um, to figure out different ways of, of teaching that are going to connect with students. So you can't just stay static. You've got to listen and continually figure out. Um, and I'll give you an example. Is that a couple of years ago, I incorporated um, required um, student office hour meetings. They come in, each student talks or with me for about 10 or 15 minutes, and we talk about what's working for you. What would you like to see improved or, or different? And I think that I'm, I'm getting some good, some good tips out of those over the past couple of years as to how to, to engage with students um, even better. Awesome. Yeah, I think getting students to take advantage of office hours as a, a, whenever in my career I've been an advisor to students or the times I've, I've taught classes, I've tried to emphasize the importance of office hours. I think having yeah. a required component where they do have to come in and have that one-on-one -on -one interaction, I think it's good for them. And then, like you said, it's great for you as an instructor to get that, that feedback and, and get, to get a sense, you know, student yeah. by student of what's going on in your class. To get That's, to know them, yeah, because otherwise you can sometimes feel like you're just – you're, you're disconnected, like there's this big barrier, and, and then your only other interaction with the student is them rushing up saying, you know, what's my grade, or, or what can I do to, you know, do better on this thing, um, you know, like very, like wanting the answer in, in two minutes or less, you know? mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I, I think that this is way better than, than having that, um, than having those kind of like rushed sort of interactions, or even worse, the email, uh, on the 15th week of the semester saying, hey, what do you offer extra credit? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, I just figured out I'm in a bad, I'm in bad yeah. shape for this course. Now what can I do to pull it out of the flames? Yeah. And instead, you know, and, and so like you just gave two great examples of, of how teaching, you know, when it's not as effective is more transactional and that, you know, that, that if we strive for the relational and the more interactive yeah. and collaborative approach, uh, oftentimes students benefit, you know, tremendously. And then we, as an, you as an yeah. instructor, you know, as a professor can benefit as well. You know, there's two kind of fun facts I wanted to, to talk about with you. And one of yeah. them is that you're currently working as a stay at home dad while you're in yeah. the midst of all these other, you know, your book and, and teaching and all those things. And so, you know, and this is a, it has been a, an example of, of what it's, you know, what it can be yeah. like when you're, and now for so many more people, um, you know, working remotely. And in most cases that's working from home and with family members, you know, kind yeah. of overlapping space and all those kinds of things. So talk about how that's, that adventure has been for you. Yeah, no, it's, it's been, it's, it's been an adventure. That's for sure. And so my son was born in October and so I was teaching two classes and, finishing up proofing and final edits on the manuscript at the same time. We were lucky that my wife had two and a half months of maternity leave. So she was able to do the bulk of the parenting while I was finishing up. And then she went back to work in early January and I made the decision to not pursue any work for the time being so that I could be the stay at home dad. Um, I had, um, some work I was doing, um, a manuscript review, and a, um, I wrote a short article for the Oregon Encyclopedia, which is free and accessible, folks. If you want a great um, little accessible chunks of history about Oregon, uh, Google that. Um, you can go on. I've written several articles, but there are hundreds and hundreds of fantastic 
articles on there about basically any aspect of Oregon history. And but so I wrote called, an article for them. What's that? It's, the, it's just called the Oregon Encyclopedia? The Oregon Encyclopedia, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, but so I, I wrote an article for them. Um, and right now, I'm though I'm just enjoying being with, with, with Evan. Um, he's just a little over five months as of this recording. Um, typically developing, happy, rolling around, trying to eat everything. Um, <laughs> not yet crawling, but when he gets there, we're, we're really going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, but you talk about what, what do you have to do when you trying to balance? And, and, and you have to plan. You have to... I'm, I'm figuring that out more and more is that um, my wife and I were staying with my parents now. And so we have to all kind of sit down and plan and figure out how is everybody's day going to go and what are the kind of hours that I can set aside for work of my own versus the hours that I can set aside for, for Evan. And, mm -hmm. um, and you have to be prepared to change the plan. Um, <laughs> and so the main thing that I'm the, the only thing that I'm trying to do right now is I'm, I'm starting some work on a new book. Um, I'm working on a book about um, a represent a U.S. representative from the Portland area named Edith Green, who was uh, in Congress from 1955 until 1974. Author of many of the great, or or co-sponsored many of the great liberal legislation of the time, things like Title IX, Higher Education Act, um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, a really fascinating, but surprisingly understudied individual that I want to, I want to dig into that a little bit more. And so doing a little bit of research, um, on the side while also being a dad is kind of my, my job right now. Right on, right on. Well, kudos to you for, for the managing and the balancing and, and making sure to remember that it's an adventure. <laughs> yeah, it is. It absolutely is. And I was hoping I, I won some money to do some research at the Oregon Historical Society, which carries her papers, but we're on lockdown, of course. So of course. once we get back into that, then I'll be able to get back into those papers and hopefully find out some interesting things about, about Edith Green. Cool, cool. Well, I look forward to, the, to your next book already. She sounds, she sounds fascinating. Thank you. All right. Well, one other fun fact is um, yeah. I hear that you worked at Powell's Books. And, yeah. and for most of our alumni and, and certainly current students, um, maybe parents, you know, they would know that that's one of the biggest, if not the biggest and most important bookstore, certainly in the Pacific Northwest, if not in the, in the, in the country, um, and that you worked there for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, what was that? And tell us about that experience. Yeah. Yeah, I was really lucky to get hired um, fairly soon out of college there as the economy was doing a, a turn down, um, not as dramatic as what's going on now. But um, but I, th I think it was a really great interim job to have. I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, but I also knew that I wanted to have a break to make a little bit of money and to use different parts of my brain to learn some different things about how do you deal with customers? How do you help people find things? How do you serve the public? How do you, and it's not just about books. It's amazing the questions you get working on the front lines and the cash registers, like where's the bathroom, of course being number one. But things like, where do I go to get Chinese food? Where do I go to get um, Italian food? Where do I go to get a cheeseburger? Where do I go to take kids who are vegetarians? Um, where do I go to find shoes? Where's Pioneer Play Small? You know, you and and you know, how do I can can you call a cab for me? But and these seem like kind of simple things, but they really help. I think more with that. I was talking about compassion and diversity, and it really helps with with those aspects. Um, you're dealing with folks sometimes who may not speak English or have limited English speaking, hard of hearing, hard of seeing. Um, and, and so you, you have to, but you also are a business and you have to keep the pace going. And so you, you kind of figure out how to do uh, both of those things. And um, I, I feel like that I was a small part, but hopefully a part nonetheless of helping pals through 
uh, a difficult time, that recession in the late mm -hmm. 2000s, um, you know, just by showing up and, and, and giving the best service that, that I could give. And, um, and I think the, the, they are struggling with COVID-19 as, as so, so many businesses are. And so I just want to put that out there for our listeners and our viewers that go buy a book from them online. They're still open. They're still, they're trying to feed and, 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 you know, give money or pay money to, to as many staffers as they can. Um, so, so go, you know, you got a lot of time, go buy some books, read, read some book, go online, buy some books, read some <laughs> books. Um, we can't let them close. They're just too important to folks who are doing uh, reading and writing um, and, and even non-liberal arts have got great, you know, if you're doing STEM or, or computers or whatnot, whatever it is that you want. Um, and I'll just finish off with, with a fun, with a fun anecdote. And, and that is to say that another great thing about working at Powell's is you got to meet a lot of celebrities, Powell's oh, wow. known around the world. Um, and so folks came in, you know, and I never met a president or a, um, or, or a, uh, a, a, a big major dignitary like that. But um, I did get to interact with the likes of um, Calista Flockhart and uh, John Malkovich. Wow. Um, and even folks like um, uh, more local celebrities like the talk show host Lars Larson and um, Bob Packwood, our own Bob Packwood. Um, wow. Um, you, you just, and, and even, and, uh, some, some local weathermen too. I, um, so you just never know who you're going to get. Um, it is, <laughs> it's, it's a cool, it was a cool experience that, that kept me on my, on my toes. That's for sure. That's awesome. Well, that's a, that's a cool way to, to kind of, to finish up our episode here and our conversation. Yeah. And I just want to thank you so much for spending this time with us today and sharing about your new book, Facing the World. And, um, look forward to it getting released as soon as possible. I mean, since it's already out, it just needs to now yeah. actually get out into the world. So that'll be fantastic. And we, and we look forward to that. And we look forward to having you um, to your talk on campus in the fall as well. Eric, it's been really delightful joining you and getting to um, get the word out to our, our listenership and viewership, but also just to, just to connect with, with more folks from Willamette this way. This is a great opportunity. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. And that's a good segue to thanks also to our, to share thanks also with our viewers. And if you enjoyed this presentation, this conversation, stay tuned as we'll be adding new content weekly. Please also share your feedback with us and send suggestions for additional content to alumni at willamette.edu.